In August 1945, America dropped a pair of bombs on two Japanese cities, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The death toll from the bombs has been nearly impossible to calculate, and that's simply because of how enormously these bombs' impact was on these two locations. But an estimated 110,000 the 210,000 lives were lost in the first months after the attack. The ripple effects of the bombs went on for decades. Not only were the radioactive after effects of the bombs impacting Japanese citizens, but even those that were not exposed to radiation, they were now dealing with the psychological effects. Fear was impossible to communicate. The inner torment of such events never goes away easily. It may last a generation, two generations. It lingers, it persists, it creeps its way into just all facets of society, including art. Take Japanese cinema. Japanese cinema of the late 40s and 50s were especially conscious of the atomic age and the horrors associated with it. The most famous example of this is the original Godzilla, but there's many more just intimate motion pictures that also explore Japanese society in the wake of just unspeakable horrors. One such title would be Akira Kurosawa's 1955 I Live in Fear. So looking back at this year, 2023, it was an interesting year for film. And I think that the two most impactful films were Oppenheimer and Godzilla Minus One. Both in a way were dramas dealing with the horrors of the atomic bomb and just the fear of weapons of mass destruction. So I thought that Akira Kurosawa's I Live in Fear would just be a great film to end this year on. This is a film that fits perfectly with the message of both Godzilla and Oppenheimer. And I feel like all three films would make a great triple feature. So the first time I actually watched I Live in Fear was quite a few years ago. And then I just rewatched it for this review. But I remember it being one of his better post-war films, but not something worth mentioning. When he has so many other great films that stand out, Obviously, his Chidaigeki period piece dramas, and of course his samurai movies. Those are usually what people go to Kurosawa for. But honestly, some of his modern Japanese films are some of his best and most emotional. Take for example, Ikaru. That film is just so powerful, I pretty much cry every time I see it. And that one really just has a timeless message. In fact, it was just remade last year and I still have yet to watch that. I heard it's really good though. But this time when I decided to just sit down and watch I Live in Fear, I was pretty much without words. You know, when you watch movies to review them, you often view them differently. So maybe that's part of it. You're usually paying attention to every aspect. Whereas if you just watch it, you don't really pay attention to everything. And this time it just really got to me. And maybe that's because of the impact of the great films that we got this year. They sort of deal with the same subject. But I think this is now definitely upper tier Kurosawa. Before it was more mid-low tier. And I really think this film should be talked about more. But I finally see why Akira Kurosawa stated that this was a film he was most proud of making. And I just really love the message that I walked away with. You know, are we the crazy ones for not being afraid? <laughs> maybe the people that we call anxious or have anxiety, maybe those are the people that know more. And just not knowing everything could be the key to having peace of mind. And this movie, when you watch it, it really just creeps up on you with that message. 
And this may actually be the only movie dealing directly with the fear that Japan had of the atomic and hydrogen bombs. The original Godzilla and also Minus One, they both deal with that but in a metaphor. That's what Godzilla represents. And with the film Oppenheimer, that deals with the fear of what these weapons will eventually do. But I also like that I Live in Fear isn't really political. Not once or any other countries even mentioned. And Kurosawa might not have viewed the subject as political. But he might have just viewed it as more of the psychological effects that it had. And if you look at his life, and just what he's lived through, it's pretty insane. In addition to living through World War II, also the attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also when he was a kid, he was a survivor of the 1923 Tokyo-Yokohama earthquake. And that was actually a very significant, catastrophic event. Go look up pictures of it. It's pretty crazy. And it killed an estimated 140,000 people. So if anyone knows about being anxious about catastrophes, it's definitely Akira Kurosawa. So I Live in Fear follows in the footsteps of Ikaru and Stray Dog. These are all Akira Kurosawa's modern cinematic films. I Live in Fear focuses on a man named Kiichi Nagajima. He's played by Toshiro Mifune. And in this, Mifune plays a much older character from what we're used to. And honestly, the first time I watched this film, I didn't even know it was him. And he transforms completely into this role of a terrified man who's obsessively just fearful of atomic bombs. Especially just knowing the horrors that these bombs could just wipe out major cities. But now some of these weapons are even stronger. At this point, the hydrogen bomb was being developed and it was said to be 1,000 times more powerful than the atomic bombs that destroyed both Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And Nagajima just has extreme PTSD over this. Every sound of thunder or any loud noise makes him believe that an atomic apocalypse is going on. And Kurosawa just does some pretty horrific scenery, especially with just the lighting. And it really lets you in on showing some of that fear that he's feeling. And we really feel bad for Nakajima. His mind is just set on the fear of the future. So he initially sets his sights on building this giant bomb shelter. And later his plans actually become more elaborate. He also wants to travel now to Brazil. And for some reason, this location, he believes, will be exempt from any nuclear fallout. And throughout the film, we're seeing that he's being condemned by his family members. They do not approve of his paranoid behavior. <laughs> the script for I Live in Fear was written by Kurosawa, Shinobu Hashimoto, and Hideo Oguni. And you can really tell they just went above and beyond to just make it very subtle, just his relationship with his family. But I also like how the film isn't afraid to just depict the more toxic ways that Nakajima's obsession is affecting other people close to him. They're not just being the bad guys for the sake of just creating drama for a film. It feels very authentic. <laughs> I'll say one of the most haunting lines in I Live in Fear, it comes from the character of Dr. Harada, who's played by Takashi Shimura. And Shimura always does just a great job at playing these sympathetic characters. And here, he's really the only one who views Nakajima with any sympathy. And he points out that the man's only flaw is just going too far. But his anxiety about the bomb is something that they all share. It's just that they don't feel it quite as strong. They don't build underground shelters. They don't plan to travel to Brazil. 
But can they claim that the feeling is beyond comprehension? Within Nakajima is a heightened sense of fear and uncertainty for days to come that has gripped Japanese society. Dr. Harada is one of the very few characters within the film that understand that. To his relatives, Nakajima's behavior is unacceptable. But it raises a question of whether or not launching a weapon of mass destruction on another country is also an acceptable act. With the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, one world has died and another has been born. Within this new world, the rules are uncertain, and the future is just dominated by chaotic uncertainty. Many people will choose to just go about their lives, because the weight of all this newness is just too much. Nakajima has chosen to be consumed by this new society and all the paranoia that comes with it. And Toshiro Mifune just does such a masterful job in this. And it's just such a change from some of Mifune's more famous roles. It's so different just the way he walks. His posture really just communicates the toll that the world is taking on this character. The horrors and what it does to someone physically. And I'm not sure why Mifune never really gets praised more for playing this character. Like I said, the first time I watched this, I didn't even know it was him. Mutated and mutant is a term and metaphor for the changes that nuclear weapons inflict upon a species. Not just sickness and deformity, but mutated consciousness. And Godzilla is a representation of this, both a metaphor and a physical being in that film. But the same could be said about the character of Nakajima. His change from a normal person and a leader of a family to this fearful and anxiety-ridden man. Nakajima wasn't us. However, if you compare it to Godzilla, Godzilla wasn't it. Director Honda in that showed what post-nuclear Japan had and could overcome. That film allowed Japanese audiences to eat their cake and have it. And while I Live in Fear was technically a box office failure, Godzilla, which came out a year before that, was just tremendously successful. Its showing of total destruction showed what might be taking place inside of someone who was terrified of the atomic bomb. So now I'm going to talk about the ending of the film, which I think is key to the overall message. You can end the video here if you want to avoid any spoilers, especially if you plan on watching this. But just know that every Kurosawa film is worth watching, and I really felt that this one was significantly better on second viewing. I found it to be a overall powerful film. And it's not a long film to get through like most of Kurosawa's films, and it doesn't feel long considering that it's purely a drama. Besides Mifune's character just hysterically beating his jerk son, I love that scene. <laughs> Besides that, there's not really any other action or violence. But the enjoyment with this film comes from mostly Kurosawa's just excellent filming, his filming techniques. There's quite a few just great shots, so movie lovers will enjoy that, especially if you just look for such things. And just Mifune's excellent performance. I think that alone makes it worth seeing. Like I said, the first time I watched this, I didn't even know it was him. And I don't know what it is about Mifune, but there's something really addictive just about his acting. His facial expressions, even his posture, acting like an old man. I love it. He really was the master in his craft, 
especially when he worked with Kurosawa. But the most you're going to get out of this film, I think, is just its powerful message. And it really even had me questioning sanity. So I think it's upper Kurosawa tier, but make sure you see his more famous ones first. Those were a must see. And I think if you're just into the Oppenheimer and Godzilla Minus One messaging, I think you might enjoy this. It's not as good as his other modern films like Ikaru. It's not as fun or as epic as his samurai films. But right underneath all those films, I think I would place this one. I think it's just great for anyone looking to watch something different and meaningful. And if you're interested in watching this, you could get it as part of the Kurosawa post-war film box set. And you get a lot of great films with that box set. I think it's much better than his pre-war films. I think those tended to be more propaganda. Except for his first film, Sinchiro Sugata. I like that film a lot. Anyway, now I'll discuss the ending. So, I Live in Fear ends on a very gloomy note. This is typical of Kurosawa films. I'm guessing he was a very pessimistic person. So, in the film at the end, Nakajima's faculty burns down. And then Nakajima comes out and he says that he burned it himself. And he did this so that his family would now have no choice but to come with him to Brazil. And this choice is also just ignoring the fact that many people who worked for him will now be without work and might starve. <laughs> and of course after this his family is just pissed off at him. And they're so pissed off that they send him to a psychiatric hospital. And it's like the one you've seen in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nests. It's scary. And Dr. Harada visits him one last time. And here, one of the psychiatrists at the hospital pretty much says the message of the film. And that is, what is sanity now in a post-nuclear bomb world? Normally, obsessive behavior like Nakajima's is just instantly deemed insane. However, this doctor wonders if Nakajima is crazy or is just everyone else. Everyone who could remain unfazed in this insane world. It's no doubt a very powerful question, especially to the audience themselves. And I could imagine the impact it would have in the 50s in Japan. But I think it's still a timeless message. <laughs> the final moments of the film see Nakajima just detached from reality. He now believes that he's no longer on planet Earth. And we just see this great shot with both of their backs just turns from the camera and they're facing the window with the sun in the background. And they're just looking at the sun, and Nakajima's just saying how he believes that he escaped Earth, and it's now a ball of fire. The movie then ends on what I believe is the standout shot of the film. Every Kurosawa film has at least one standout shot, and this is it. And this is where we see Shimura's character just slowly walking down the stairs. Ultimately just feeling bad for Nakajima being unable to even help him. So I Live in Fear definitely offers up a powerful cinematic depiction of the psychological effect of living in a world where the impossible is now just a terrifying event in one's own history book. It also functions as a reminder that there was no guide when it came to how Japanese citizens should react to the bombs. This insane world is now our own. And much like Nakajima's relatives just ignoring the point of this man's obsessions, I think many of us 
choose a comforting blindness to the world. Even now, there's a lot of bad things going on. But we don't think about them every day. We'd go insane. And again, this is really the only film I've seen that deals directly with just the fear that the Japanese could have felt at this time period. So the best films of 2023 reminded us of something that happens almost 80 years ago. But it's still just a really important message even today. With the film Oppenheimer, it left us with the fear of what weapons of mass destruction will eventually bring. Where with Godzilla Minus One, it showed us how important it is to just keep rebuilding and living, no matter what horrible things happen to us. Just keep getting up and keep going. And out of these two films, I definitely choose Godzilla Minus One as my favorite, and I just love its hopeful message. Something that was not in Oppenheimer or I Live in Fear. And that's honestly the message i rather leave with. I would rather be wrong and live a happy life than be miserable but be right. Anyway, I want to thank my audience and subscribers for a great year. And I'm just going to be going into the next year with the same optimism. Anyway, thanks for watching. Thank you.